Welcome back, learners. Margate's appeal as a tourist destination came about due to the rise in popularity of medicinal sea bathing in the 1730s. In 1752, Dr. Richard Russell published his dissertation on the use of seawater in the diseases of the glands, which described the health benefits of sea bathing and drinking seawater. This led to a huge trend of people visiting England's seaside towns and using bathing machines to enjoy the ocean. These bathing machines were essentially beach huts on wheels, which allowed users a place to get changed and could be rolled into the sea. In Margate, 1753, a Quaker and glove maker named Benjamin Beale modified the bathing machines by adding a canvas hood which could extend out into the water, allowing the modest bathers to wade in the sea without being seen by the opposite sex. It became possible to bathe nude, whereas before even the swimming costumes of the time were considered improper to be seen in public. This revolutionised the activity and Margate became a hot spot for visitors. Naked bathing was banned in 1862 and bylaws were passed to ensure the sexes were segregated by 60 feet and wore bathing gowns or drawers. The Royal Sea Bathing Hospital was opened in 1791 and was the first of its kind in the world. Patients would be pushed in their beds from their wards to appreciate the fresh air and could bathe in the seawater reservoir. It was believed that this was the best cure for tuberculosis. Over the years, sea bathing became a pleasurable pastime, more than a primarily medicinal one, and so Margate developed into a holiday resort, welcoming large crowds of visitors. This success couldn't have come at a better time. In 1723, Reverend John Lewis described in his History of the Isle of Thanet that Margate was primarily a small fishing town, but the industry was in decline and many local fishermen had given up the trade. This was at least in part due to the methods used by the fishermen. During the reigns of Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, they would bring in huge hauls of cod, haddock, mackerel and herring, as well as all the other popular fish, and also oysters, eels and even lobsters. But they would do this by pulling up the habitats of the sea creatures and burning anything they didn't use. The destruction of the environment meant less sea life in the area and therefore less to catch. The practice was banned in about 1593, but many fishermen continued anyway, finding that the authorities had little power to stop them. Holiday makers from London would usually take a stagecoach with a change at Canterbury, meaning a journey of 13 to 14 hours. By 1810, many were beginning to make the journey by sea, starting in the Thames, as it was both cheaper and faster. The first steamboat arrived in 1815, and this was the first of a long line of steamboats and paddle steamers which served the town right up until the 1950s. These reduced the journey time even further to around seven hours. This made Margate an unusually diverse place, as it was visited by rich and poor alike, who would usually not mix in any other situation. Although, some of the wealthier visitors decided to make themselves feel more at home by building accommodation that was styled after London architecture. Margate has more to it than meets the eye, and with the rise in visitors and development came fascinating discovery. So welcome to the Margate Caves, which were found in 1802. Would you like to tell us more about the chalk mines? Yes, they, they extracted it to uh, take to lime kilns to burn, to get the lime out, to help build houses when Margate was expanding. You're looking at about 2,000 tonne of chalk, because they used, the, uh, they burned them to get the lime out, to make bricks and cement uh, to build houses. And the amount of chalk they took out of here was enough to build between 200 and 300 houses. Wow, that's fantastic. And how were they discovered? <laughs> that was a pure accident with the uh, Francis Forster, who brought a school and having a school renovated. <laughs> While he's having the, the school renovated, back to a house, he got his gardeners to do the garden. And one of his gardeners fell through the shaft above us. And that is how the caves were discovered. They were originally a simple chalk mine in use around 100 years earlier that he had then put to use as a fancy wine cellar with new murals painted on the walls. However, in 1863, new owners attempting to make fast cash from the ticket sales invented stories about them, including renaming them the Vortigan Caves, claiming they were an Iron Age site, and that in more recent times they were a smuggler's hideout. Although the stories were embellished to some extent, there was perhaps some truth to some of it. The caves were under an Iron Age site, as archaeologists found a buried body during excavations, but nothing connects that to the 18th century mines. It is likely that the fantastic tales are invented to compete with a nearby Shell Grotto, which truly is a mystery. Discovered in 1835, the Shell Grotto is an underground tunnel and chamber covering about 2,000 square feet, which has been decorated with over 4.6 million shells in complex patterns. Nobody knows when it was built or by whom. 
Though there are theories it was a lodge for the Knights Templar in the 12th century, or even a pagan ritual chamber in use 3,000 years ago. A curious detail is that most of the shells are local mussels, cockles, oysters and whelks, etc. But there are also flat winkle shells that would have had to have come from Southampton, over 150 miles away. Though the mystery of the grotto and the legendary embellishments may initially seem more interesting than a simple chalk mine, the Margate Caves are full of real history that is just as exciting. One of the murals depicts Richard Joy, also known as the Thanet Giant, or the Kentish Samson. Born in 1675, he was a local farmer who stood at 7 foot 7 and often impressed people with feats of strength. He got into smuggling and he got caught. The magistrate said to him, you know, to royalty, so I'm going to give you two choices. You can be hung tomorrow morning or you go into the Navy, so he opted for the Navy. In the Navy, he used to get a shot of rum with a bit of lime, and that stopped scurvy, uh, also to do with vitamins, yeah. or one thing or another. So he said to his captain, look, the size of me, you know what I mean, I deserve an extra shot of rum. So the captain goes, okay then. The captain's most probably heard of him, and he said, all right, pick a load of can up, call in his bluff, and move it. So he did. Pick the can up, and moved it. It took six to put it back on the other side of the ship. <laughs> <laughs> but poor so and so didn't get his extra shot run. He returned to smuggling in later life and drowned at the age of 67 on a run. And they buried him over at St Peter's churchyard in Broadstairs. Yeah. His grave is at the back. Oh, um, oh he's the famous pirate my parents used to take me to see. The caves are full of stories and secrets like this. Have fun trying to find the hidden Skeletor. India House is a Grade 2 listed building and was constructed in 1766. At the time it was described as the best house in Margate. It was built by Captain John Gould who made his fortune as a tea planter in Calcutta and owned a fleet of ships which travelled between there and the town of Deal on behalf of the East India Company. The house was designed as a replica of the home he owned in Calcutta. Gould is recorded as possibly the first ever person to retire to the seaside. After his death, the East India Company used it as an office. Sometime in the 19th century, it became referred to as Custom House and was drawn by Turner in 1832. In 1849, it was bought by John Harvey Boys for £650. His son, Toke Harvey Boys, followed in his father's footsteps and became a solicitor with the reputation of being one of the straightest English gentlemen ever met, referring to his honesty. He partnered with C.E. Morn in 1902 to create a legal firm that still practices throughout Kent to this day. Toke Harvey Boys had five daughters, thus fulfilling a long-term family prophecy that the boys' line would die out with five girls. The building commemorates Miss Phyllis Harriet Wright Broughton, who lived in the property from 1897 to 1917. She was one of the Gaiety Girls, a highly popular musical comedy act that was considered more respectable than the dancing girls of variety shows. She bought the property with her own money, but had a trustee make the deal on her behalf. This was Lieutenant General Coot Singe Hutchinson, a highly respected military officer who earned a medal for his service during the Indian Rebellion of 1857. He owns the property for one month before passing it on to Broughton. She sold the property to Cyril Collingwood Morn in 1920 and it has since served as the head office of Boys and Morn solicitors. Strokes Adventure Golf at Westbrook Bay has hosted the British Open Tournament for Mini Golf six times between 2007 and 2021. Join us next time when we talk about some conflicts and controversies that shook Margate.